Hey, Al Scott here for MyHeroesThink.com. They sell beautiful 7-inch busts of libertarian heroes Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, Ron Paul, and Harry Brown. I've got the Harry Brown one on the bookshelf now. Makes me smile every time it catches my eye. These finely crafted statues from MyHeroesThink.com make excellent decorations for your desktop at work, bookends for your shelves, or gifts for that special individualist in your life. They're also all available in colors now, too. Of course, gold, silver, or bronze. Coming soon, Hayek, Hazlitt, Carlin. Use promo code Scott Horton and save $5 at MyHeroesThink.com. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show. I got Adam Morrow on the phone. That's good. He's a reporter for Interpress Service at IPSnews.net. How's it going, Adam? It's going okay. How's it going, Scott? I'm doing good. Appreciate you joining us again. Of course, uh, I meant to say, everybody knows I meant to say that uh, you're reporting from Cairo, Egypt right now. Uh, yeah, that's correct. It's kind of important to mention, you know, when I'm asking you what's going on in Egypt, <clears throat> that you're there. Fair hey, enough. Fair enough. Through the, the magic of electronic technology these days, uh, I got you on the phone with hardly a delay. Uh, it's just great. Yeah, that's Tell incredible. me this, Adam. Uh, how's the restoration of democracy going? The restoration of democracy is going poorly in Egypt, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I don't know what, what are the main headlines. I'm just, I'm, <clears throat> if I can be a little bit selfish, I'm just. What are, what are, what are the sort of the main headlines that are that are coming to you guys in the states right now about Egypt? I mean, what's is it mostly constitution stuff? Is it you know like you know an, an occasional uh, uh, protest that breaks out in Tahrir Square? I mean, what sort of news are you? What, what's dominating the headlines from Egypt uh, for American uh, audiences? The only thing I've seen in forever is that Hegel called CC and said, hey, be a little bit nicer, and I hope you hold some elections at some point or something. Uh, but other okay. than that, you know, I guess I wouldn't call it a blackout, but it's kind of a brownout anyway. It's certainly not covered mm. on TV at all. And oh, uh, wow. no, they That's don't. If, okay. if there's a big protest, nothing. There's some coverage <clears throat> of uh, the, some young ladies, quite a few of them, I believe. Uh, being prosecuted for protesting in pro-Muslim Brotherhood protests against the oh, military dictatorship. Oh, okay, that's being reported, though. That's, that's, that's something, okay. But, that's, I, that's quite, but that's it is far that's... from, you know, a big cause like Pussy Riot in Russia or something like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, right, of course. Nothing of course. like that, because we're on the other side. We're on the dictatorship side in this one. <laughs> um, well, now, so, by the way, it's been since... Um, uh, was it the beginning of June or the beginning of July when, when the dictators overthrew the Muslim Brotherhood now? June, right? It was Ju July 3rd oh, was July th the military coup. And then mm -hmm. June, June 30th were, were, the, were the mass of the beginning of the mass, of the, the mass demonstrations that came out. Right. right. Uh, and then three days later, uh, you had him declaring, basically removing Morsi. And not just removing Morsi, but, but arresting all of the leaders of the Brotherhood and their, and their, and their legal political party and all of this sort of thing. So it's been, it's been uh, five months, actually. It's been five months, remarkably. Hmm. So um, uh, under the Mubarak regime, they tolerated the Muslim Brotherhood. Not that they let them have majority power in the parliament or anything like that. Um, uh, or any they real power, but they them, let them they, be they, them, right? But now the, they, well, the organization is outlawed, is that correct? Or just the they, political well, party? Yeah, the, under Mubarak, they were, they were formally outlawed, but they still were allowed to field candidates in parliament uh, on an independent basis, which was, was kind of a weird compromise that mm -hmm. the, the two forces reached. Uh, and uh, and uh, as we know, under Mubarak, all of the elections were, were, were famously in, in, known to be rigged. Um, but that didn't stop the Brotherhood from, in 2005, in the first round of parliamentary elections in 2005, Mubarak, in what what people people sort of believe was sort of a was sort of a way of letting America know, because there was a lot of pressure at that time for democratization. If you remember, there was a lot of pressure, whether or not it was sincere, that was coming out of Washington at the time, sort of pushing these Arab. It was post Iraq, so there was a lot of call, a lot of calls for dem democratization in the region and that sort of thing um, at that time. Uh, so uh, 
So what Mubarak did was he he actually let the first round of parliamentary elections in 2005 he let them open he let he let the, he didn't he didn't fix them he let them just sort of go, and in that first round of, of of elections alone the Brotherhood picked up 88 seats or something like that picked up this huge number and then they immediately began rigging or the the, the the next three rounds of elections they immediately rigged and they they sort of caught them at night let them get 90 seats with Parliament so my point being they were they were actually a parliamentary force even under Mubarak even though they were outlawed. So you have the situation where they were formally outlawed, but they were allowed to contest elections, sometimes quite successfully, uh, on an independent, as long as they ran into, on an independent ticket and didn't call themselves a Muslim Brotherhood or a Muslim Brotherhood party. All right, now those uh, now days are long government. over now, and the organization yeah, itself is outlawed. It's become existential. Oh yeah, now the battle has become existential. Now you've got, um, I mean, massive crackdowns. You've got uh, you've got the the killing in on August 14th. If you remember, there was a big sit-in. Uh, it was, uh, you know, in the month and a half after the coup, you had tens of thousands of Islamist Morsi supporters, but possibly even hundreds of thousands. It's indeterminate, impossible to tell exactly how many people would flock to Rabah al a Square uh, in Cairo. Uh, and they stayed there. They managed to, to sort of hold the fort there for about uh, six, six weeks. And they were actually being visited. When they were there, they were being visited by foreign delegations and, and foreign diplomats and stuff like that, which was really freaking out the new... You know the new powers that be the new, you know the, the new military the new military backed rulers, so they had to they had to do away with that. And on August fourteenth, they went in and they completely cleared it uh, and killed upwards of looks like something like eight nine hundred people. Um, really, really, really vicious. I mean, unprecedented in Egypt's modern history. Anything like that. Um, and ever since then, you've had uh, you know you've had uh, these daily protests, demonstrates. Never gotten as bad as uh, you know not 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 that you've you've had occasional massacres since then it's on a much smaller scale. But until now, you continue to have this dynamic where every day you're seeing quite large, quite substantial protests in all different parts of Cairo. I mean, I'm looking at some right now on from Gazira's live channel that's covering some of the live ones coming in from the provinces. Uh, every day, I mean, without fail, every day. And uh, in, some ca- in some cases, apparently, they're drawing larger and larger crowds. You're getting, you know, I'm sure you've seen, it's not just Islamists anymore, but you've now got massive student groups. You've probably seen coverage of some of this. Uh, you've got massive student demonstrations that are taking place. Uh, two, uh, two or three days ago, you had a, an engineering student getting killed uh, in, uh, during, uh, during one of these demonstrations when police intervene, intervened to sort of break it up with tear, ga- tear gas and shotguns. And one of these kids got killed, and that just, that just sort of you know, galvanized the whole, the whole university, you know, the whole student movement. And you've been seeing larger and larger campus demonstrations every day, again, all over the country, in, in Upper Egypt, in the universities in Upper Egypt, and some of the universities in the canal cities like uh, Suez and Ismailia, uh, and then Cairo University, of course, Ain Shams University, which is in Cairo. Um, and uh, El Azhar University actually has seen the, the, the most, uh, although nothing has happened in the last week or two, the, the, the El Azhar University has actually seen the most violent, sort of clashes. <clears throat> and you've also, at the same time, you've also seen these incredibly harsh sentences being handed down on pro-Morsi demonstrators. One example being the, the girls you mentioned. I mean, you're, you're talking about these girls, most of them are in their early 20s. They're all, they're all wearing the hageb, you know, they all look, they're obviously, you know, these like incredibly harmless girls who are out join, you know, out joining a, you know, at a, at a pro-Morsi protest. And they were all rounded up in October and they were charged with uh, these ludicrous charges like blocking roads and attacking pedestrians and, uh, you know, and inciting violence and things like that, and received 11 years uh, uh, in prison each. Uh, that was just about five or six days ago. And that, 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 that those are the, you, know, you probably saw pictures of them, and that, that caused a tremendous backlash as well, uh, specifically against the judiciary, um, which, as, we, as you know from earlier conversations, this remains Mubarak's judiciary. You know, um, the judiciary was never touched in the three years since the January 25th revolution. The judiciary remains m- as it was under Mubarak. So, uh, so people are outraged over that, but uh, <clears throat> but the status quo remains intact for the time being. Yeah, I mean they don't it doesn't sound like they have anybody really to rally around. So what are they going to do about it? They can be upset, but all they can do is just go out and protest and get bashed over the head themselves, basically, right? Yeah, exactly. Although that being said, though, um, 
In the last couple of weeks, uh, it does look like the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the coup leaders and, and such have sort of have, have kind of lost control. One, one thing that most people, uh, you know, there's consensus about at this point is that they never imagined when they planned this whole thing, they never imagined that the reaction was going to be as, as big and as, as, as persistent as it's proven to be. Um, now, like we said, we're five months since the July 3rd coup, and you still have people taking to the streets in massive numbers. They, you know, this is something that they're desperately trying to downplay in the media, and both the private, all, you know, all of the private media in Egypt, as well as, obviously, all of the state media, is all entirely pro-army. It does not vary from the, from the, from the, uh, from the, from the army line at, at all. Mm-hmm. Does not move out of lockstep. Again, both the, the private and the public media here um, do not move out of lockstep with the military. The, the, uh, these protests um, and, uh, you know, the, the basic, the crackdown on the brotherhood that we've seen since the coup um, are, are constantly being portrayed in, on television and in the media as, uh, as a war against terrorism. They basically adopted the whole American post-9-11 War on terror, sort of thing. It's kind of gross. It's kind of you know. It's kind of gross after having having lived through that for so long post nine eleven. All the you know the overplaying of the whole terrorist thing sure. uh, to see it play out to see it play out in an in an Arab country. You know, in, a, in an actual Arab country where the actual regime is is uh, is, uh, is is starting to employ that kind of the same sort of language and that same kind of extremely simplistic outlook where it's the, you know this us versus them sort of stuff that came out after uh, after nine eleven. Yeah, I mean, you think about the parallel would be if, you know, all the Republican rhetoric about how anyone who was against their war agenda, most of whom were either Democrats or leaning left one way or the other during those early post 9-11 years there under George W. Bush, they called everybody a terrorist or a terrorist sympathizer, this, that. But it was just a smear. Well, yeah. It's not like they yeah, really, they waged the war on terror against a hell of a lot of innocent Iraqis, but they didn't like outright unleash the army on, and the and the Secret Service on the American people in that sense, you know, acting like they really meant it, rounding up Democrats just for being Democrats and, and basically calling them traitors, something like that. I mean, this is way, well, way out of control if you put of, in that the context. Same dynamic. You have the same dynamic playing out here, but like on steroids, you know, um, where very, very quickly it began with the uh, Rabbi Ladawaya massacre that I mentioned earlier. If you remember, that was the first time that a major crack appeared uh, in the whole, you know, in the whole new ruling structure was when Boradai and and one other guy uh, uh, resigned. If you remember that, they were all firm supporters of June thirtieth. They were all supporters of the military coup. But when they, when, when, the, when the, uh, when the security forces moved in and killed all those people, killed all those uh, mostly unarmed demonstrators uh, on August fourteenth, um, Boradai resigned, uh, as, as did another major figure in their in their coalition. And that was kind of the first sort of the, the sort of first sort of show of dissent. And from what I understand, is I mean. It's only they're only get becoming more hawkish, you know. I mean, there there's talk about a, a a looming cabinet reshuffle in which people who have you know anybody who's even floated the idea of reconciliation with the Brotherhood should be should be you know should be uh, should be excluded. And this this whole idea of accusing people of being with the Brotherhood this has been going on since Morsi was in the presidency. Everybody that he would appoint would be accused somehow of being uh, a brotherhood sleeper cell or something like that. Anybody who showed any kind of sympathy, anybody who was, basically anybody who was willing to work with them was accused by some quarters, was accused by the most extreme quarters of, of being a, 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 a secret brotherhood cell, to the point where, um, the point where Sisi himself, when he was appointed defense minister by, uh, by Morsi, was actually accused of, uh, if, if you remember when, when Morsi got rid of the old guys, uh, Tantawi and Anen, the two, the, the, the two former chiefs of the, uh, of the Supreme Military Council, uh, he replaced them with Sisi, who became the defense minister. And Sisi himself was accused by some quarters of, uh, of being a, a, a secret brotherhood agent, you know, simply by virtue of the fact that Morsi had appointed him. So, uh, so this whole thing about accusing anybody who steps out of line, you know, anybody who suggests a moderate course, anybody who suggests, you know, hey, maybe we shouldn't, like, annihilate the entire Islamist current in Egypt, anybody like that is, is, uh, is, is prone these days in the current environment, you know, in this, in this current rabidly pro-army, uh, uh, very, very jingoistic environment. Anybody who moves out of lockstep a little bit is, uh, and we've seen we've seen a lot of resignations. You've had, you've had a lot of um, 
respectable people, people who didn't buy into it, people who were too intelligent to buy into it, and people who had too much uh, integrity to buy into it, journalists and that sort of thing, sort of leaving their positions at, at newspapers and stuff like this, and watching newspapers that had once been, you know, at least had a veneer of respectability, just turn into total pro-army rags, you know, almost That's overnight. Yeah. Well, now, so yeah. what about this being a self-fulfilling prophecy? And, uh, you know, I mean, it's not hard to imagine that the average uh, young, irate Muslim Brotherhood supporter or supporter of what used to be the Muslim Brotherhood uh, might find himself agreeing with Ayman al-Zawahiri that I guess the Muslim Brotherhood were a bunch of suckers for thinking they could play the West's democracy game and that a legitimate election would mean anything. The Americans well, are always going to insist on military dictatorship and so jihad and all of that crap, right? I mean, uh, and in well, fact, let, let as long as you're going there, me. why not do that on purpose if you're the military dictatorship? Go ahead and make real enemies out of these guys. Get a few suicide bombings to happen or whatever, and then you can have a real ass war, you know, like Assad. Well, look, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, I mean, there have been, along with these peaceful demonstrations that have been going on on a, on a daily basis, there have also, there's also been a huge upswing in violence, uh, which we've also, we, 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 we spoke, spoke about a bit, a, a bit in, our last, uh, in our last conversation. There have been these regular attacks on police and army personnel, um, some of them quite spectacular, some of them quite brazen, um, most of them in the, uh, in, the northern, uh, in the northern Sinai Peninsula, but there have also been, there have also been attacks uh, uh, in uh, on in Egypt proper, those have kind of slowed down over the last week or two. There haven't been so many. There are isolated reports. There's not. There hasn't been anything too big. Um, but uh, but yeah, I just wanted to mention that just because I mean it's not it's not like these. Uh, and and again, the the relation. Needless to say, the pro army media and, and and army spokesmen will will immediately assume a direct link between. You know the Brotherhood and and these attacks going on. Meanwhile, the the, the pro Morsi people will sort of distance. The Brotherhood will sort of distance themselves from these facts, saying, "Look, we're not responsible," which is entirely possible. Who who exactly is responsible still remains sort of you know still remains very much open to question. You know the um, the uh, the pro army uh, people will 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 try to try to draw a uh, try to draw a connection with uh, with Hamas and the Gaza Strip, which doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Most of those accusations don't don't, don't hold up to any scrutiny. They just don't make any sense. Uh, please go ahead and segue into Gaza all you like, too, please, sir. Uh, well, uh, uh, if you want to talk into Ga about Gaza specifically, we can. Um, I mean, uh, what happened? The the July third coup was a huge blow to Hamas. Um, which is in a serious bind right now because uh, not only has it lost its uh, its big ally to the south, which was which was which was uh, Morsi, and you remember the Mubarak regime had a very um, had a very antagonistic relationship with uh, with Hamas uh, and uh, and uh, Morsi's uh, victory in elections uh, in 2012 was uh, well. Um, would have totally changed the equation uh, for Hamas, uh, which is now doubly isolated as well because of the because they've they've sort of lost their home base in Syria as well. The, what's going on in Syria has also cost them their their home base in Syria, so they're sort of they're sort of stuck there. But I wanted to I wanted to go back to to the to, to Egypt just for a second because uh, sure. we, we, one of the biggest one of the big sort of changes in U.S. policy. You were saying how it just hasn't been covered that much in the media over there. I'm just I, it's just interesting. Did did. Uh, when Kerry uh, about a week ago, yes, did you did you even catch this? What he said, he he came out and basically said that uh, that the Brotherhood had stolen the uh, January twenty fifth revolution, which was which was pretty radical. Um, oh no, I did of, not realize know. that he had doubled down on his claim that this is the restoration of democracy here. Uh, I was of course mocking him with my first question for you there, uh, his statement mm. that a military nullifying an election. <laughs> Uh, indefinitely uh, is the restoration of democracy. But I guess if democracy means you do uh, whoever in question does exactly what the U.S. State Department says they better do, then I guess it is democracy. You just, most people don't understand the term in that sense. But um, well, No, I did not, and they did not cover that as far as I know. Uh, I didn't see any coverage mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, that was big news here. But what's remarkable is not only did he... Um, you know, not only did he praise Egypt's new military-backed rulers, 
but he also accused the, the Brotherhood of stealing uh, the January 25th Revolution, which I think is kind of dangerous because, I mean, if anything, they, um, they, played, the, they played the game, you know? Um, they, can't be, they, you know? They can't be accused of having rigged elections or anything like that. Uh, you know, you've got your usual, the usual complaints that people make here, like they, you know, they, they deceive people by using religion and mixing religion and politics, you know, all these sort of tired old accusations against the Brotherhood. But in terms of, you know technically running an electoral campaign and, you know, sort of fielding candidates and, uh, you know, you know, all of this sort of stuff. I mean, they play, they played the game and they, they, they won, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you could chalk it up to the lack of competition, you could chalk, chalk it up to the fact that none of their political rivals had their acts together, you know, one iota, which would be true. But nevertheless, they, they you know, they played the game. Um, you know they they've uh, they haven't been involved in any sort of violent activity since the 1950s there have you know they've they've denounced violence for like more than 50 years they played the game and they they won all these elections and that that and then and then Morsi was overthrown and their part the their democratically elected parliament which they had dominated was uh, was uh, summarily uh, dissolved uh, in 2012 by the by the military as well people forget that as well that they lost a full parliament as well as a presidency um, so that brings us back to the thing that you said earlier the, the the question you had earlier about you know these like aggrieved young you know Muslim Brotherhood you know uh, Muslim Brotherhood guys are they gonna you know, are they going to are they going to come around to this idea that that, that they that they've been hearing that, that democracy doesn't pay off and that it's you know violence and jihad are the only means to accomplish their ends and that sort of thing? I mean, what what conclusion would you draw if you were one of them? Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, if if I was maybe in their not that one, but I can certainly understand where they'd be coming from. Yeah, and uh, I mean, and, if you wanna, if you wanna. You well, know, look, I mean, wanna... obviously what Kerry means, and this is obvious, maybe, you know, the you're saying the dictatorship has an iron grip on the media and all that, but uh, for anybody else in the world who's not American, they know that all Kerry means is they stole it from us. They stole it from the people that we wanted to win, which was the young and liberal and malleable, um, who, you know, and in fact, even that was really their second choice, of course, uh, what they really wanted was Omar Suleiman, and and even then they only wanted him, and he was the head of the secret police uh, rendition division. But they only wanted him after they finally gave up on doing everything they could to keep Mubarak. I mean, hell, Ronald Reagan told Ferdinand Marcos, "You got to go, pal." But Barack Obama did everything he could to keep Mubarak in power as long as he could, and then he said, "Okay, okay, let's have the the head of the secret torture police in." And then when that didn't work, they said, "Okay, well." Let's try to get the young April 6th movement types. They'll do what they're told or whatever. But as you say, they weren't prepared. The Muslim Brotherhood, at least, as we were talking about, they have a history. And uh, they at least they're a known quantity to the people of Egypt. And they were just in the catbird seat. They, they inherited the revolution. It was never going to be the, the young liberals, not in a fair fight. And not even with the CIA right, right. bankroll on them either, you know? Right, right. Yeah, people. The people have to remember that all through the Mubarak regime, they, they, you know, all through the long Mubarak era, they really were the only real opposition force. You know, they were the well, only. Well, they got to remember too <laughs> that they, they're actually, and I don't know everything about them, but from what I do know about them, I disagree with them on just about everything. They're pretty much hardcore right wing conservatives, but they are not bomb throwing radical terrorists. They're conservatives right, by right. definition. They're old enough and rich enough to want to keep what they have. It's like a Republican right, or right. maybe a real right wing one. Right. Well, the the, the 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 socialists here accuse them, you know, accuse them of being neoliberal uh, economists and all of this sort of thing. Oh yeah. Well, I'm sure they're going to love the the economy as it as it grows uh, into more and more military control from here. I mean, this is something we've been talking about for two years now. Is uh, or three? No, two. Uh, about how. What some huge percentage of the economy, more than half, is in the hands of the military in the first place, and that never changed. The deep state never went away. That was why it's so easy for them to take the whole thing back. Right, right. Hey, Scott, I just want to mention also really quickly, just because it's kind of could be relevant. Yeah, we got to uh, go real right quick, before, so make it quick. Right before what Kerry said, what he what he said, uh, the a big a major Russian delegation came to the, came to Egypt, and there's been a lot of talk right now about Egypt shifting its alliances, basically from reliance and dependence on on the U.S. to more of dependence on Russia, which apparently is like really really open to the idea to offset the losses it's taking in Syria. Yeah, but who's going to pay him three billion dollars a year to pretend to not hate Israel? 
Russia? Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, that's well, right. with help with the Gulf, help, help, help from some friends in the Gulf. Right. Yeah, I guess the Saudis can make up the shortfall. All right, we got to go. Thanks very much, Adam. Great to talk to you again. Take care, Scott. All right, y'all, that's the great Adam Morrow from IPSnews.net. We'll be right back. Hey, all, Scott Horton here for the Future Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation. As you may already be aware, Jacob Hornberger, Sheldon Richmond, and James Bovard are awesome. They're also in every issue of the Future Freedom, and they're joined by others of the best of the libertarian movement. People like Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, Lawrence Vance, Joe Stromberg, and many more. Even me. Sign up for the Future Freedom at fff.org slash subscribe. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 to read it online. That's the Future Freedom, edited by Sheldon Richmond at fff.org slash subscribe. And tell me heard it here. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here to talk to you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State, The Cold War Origins of the Military-Industrial Complex and the Power Elite. In the book, Swanson explains what the revolution was, the rise of empire, and the permanent military economy, and all from a free market libertarian perspective. Jacob Hornberger, founder and president of the Future Freedom Foundation, says the book is absolutely awesome, and that Swanson's perspectives on the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis are among the best I've read. The poll numbers say that people agree on one thing. It's that America is on the wrong track. In the war state, Swanson gets to the bottom of what's ailing our society. Empire. The permanent national security bureaucracy that runs it, and the mountain of debt that has enabled our descent down this dark road. The war state could well be the book that finally brings this reality to the level of mainstream consensus. America can be saved from its government and its arms dealers. First, get the facts. Get The War State by Michael Swanson, available at your local bookseller and at Amazon.com. Or just click on the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org. Hey, I'll Scott here, hawking stickers for the back of your truck. They've got some great ones at libertystickers.com. Get your son killed, Jeb Bush, 2016. FDR, no longer the worst president in American history. The National Security Agency, blackmailing your congressman since 1952. And USA, sometimes we back Al-Qaeda, sometimes we don't. And there's over a thousand other great ones on the wars, police, state, elections, the Federal Reserve, and more at libertystickers.com. They'll take care of all your custom printing for your band or your business at thebumpersticker.com. Libertystickers.com. Everyone else is still Stickers suck. Hey, you own a business? Maybe we should consider advertising on the show. See if we can make a little bit of money. My email address is scott at scotthorton.org. Fact. The new NSA data center in Utah requires 1.7 million gallons of water every single day to operate. Billions of Fourth Amendment violations need massive computers and the water to cool them. That water is being supplied by the state of Utah. Fact. There's absolutely nothing in the Constitution which requires your state to help the feds violate your rights. Our message to Utah? Turn it off. No water equals no NSA data center. Visit offnow.org.